So good evening to all of you and welcome to the fourth episode of our Know Your Regulator series. Uh, the Know Your Regulator series is something we organize in collaboration with NCAER, the Forum of Indian Regulators and the Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs. I'm Arkaja Singh, I'm a fellow at CPR and a part of our state capacity initiative. The Know Your Regulator series you know, uh, this is some, the Know Your Regulator series is very important part of our, you know, at the center, our, our thinking about Indian regulation and our program of work in which we are interested in the legal and policy frameworks, the organizational structures of the regulatory state and the long term efforts of, to build up regulatory institutions in India. We're also very interested in the people and in the, in, and in the everyday life of regulatory agencies. And so in this KYR series, it is our privilege to talk about all of this with the people who run our regulatory agencies. We're also very privileged to have Mr. Praveen Kumar here, who is Director General and CEO of the Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs. Very welcome, sir. And uh, IICA, as we know, is a key partner in this program. And we are very happy to have Mr. Praveen Kumar here to provide some introductory remarks. But before I hand over to him, I'll briefly introduce our speakers today. Our special guest is Mr. Supratim Bandhupadhyay, who is chairperson of the Pension Fund Regulatory and Development Authority. He assumed charge in February 2020. And prior to taking over this new assignment, Mr. Bandhupadhyay was whole time member finance of BFRDA for two years. He has a lot of experience in the field of insurance, and he spent 35 years in the Life Insurance Corporation of India, where he's headed various divisions, including their division of investment and, and their own pension funds. Mr. Bandhupadhyay is a science graduate and a qualified chartered accountant. He will be in conversation today with Dr. K.P. Krishnan and Dr. Abha Yadav. Dr. Krishnan is a former civil servant with a deep interest in regulation. He belongs to the 1983 batch of the IAS and has served in various positions in the government of Karnataka, the government of India, and at the World Bank. He's authored a lot of reports on, Indian, on the Indian financial sector and published many academic papers. He has a degree in economics from St. Stephen's College, law from the University of Delhi, and a PhD in economics from the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. Dr. Abha Yadav is an associate professor at IICA and she leads their research and capacity building initiatives at the School of Competition Law and Market Regulation. She is also director of the Foyer Center at IICA and course director of their prestigious certificate course in competition law and, in the, and of the advanced professional course in competition law and market regulation. Uh, so with these brief introductions, I'll now hand over to, to you, Mr. Praveen Kumar, to provide some introductory remarks before we get into today's session. Thank you, Arkaya. Uh, welcome to everyone to this Know Your Regulator series, which is becoming an institution in itself over time, uh, which people look forward to that, which, to which, 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 which regulator to get acquainted to. I would like to thank the stakeholders of the FIRE, uh, the, the School of Competition Law, ISCA, Center for Policy Research, and NCAER. Uh, I would like to welcome and thank Mr. Bandhapadhyay, Chairperson of PFRDA, who has kindly agreed to, to be in conversation with uh, Mr. Krishnan and Abha. And so welcome Dr. Krishnan and Dr. Abha Yadav also for the, agreeing to do this conversation with with the chairperson PFRDA. See, when I was director in Ministry of then called Company Affairs, uh, and I was struggling with the amendment to the Competition Act in light of the Supreme Court judgments, one issue we also wanted to address was the issue of conflict between the regulators. We came to a very tortuous but acceptable solution by tweaking then the then existing Section 21 of the Act and adding Section 21A which by providing for a consultative mechanisms whenever some disputes arose. Now FOIR seeks to achieve the same thing in an institutional manner where, where and has been playing a very good role in bringing all the regulators to, together who can exchange their views, get to know the other points of view and, and avoid conflicts, uh, overlapping of jurisdictions and other things, which occurs normally in any business activity. Uh, this, forum shopping, other things 
all these things can be addressed to a very meaningful discussion in fire now 38 regulatory bodies are already participating in fire and i hope over time all regulatory bodies including sebi and rbi become part of it iac is proud to be associated uh, especially with the and also and like thank fire for having the fire center located at iac uh, which, which uh, through which we are able to contribute to the regulatory sector uh, it helps in enhancing cooperation and coordination of various regulatory bodies which eventually will lead to quality increase in the quality of ease of doing business in the country uh, and uh, will i will like to work as in for the center to evolve common strategies to meet the challenges which the regulators may be having share information and experiences towards this end uh, ic has also in collaboration to fire has, has developed several programs and research projects for the objective of fire in terms of academic upgradation and skill development for the members of fire one of the major initiative of this fire center is having this kvr kyr series no your regulator series initiative is a very commendable effort especially seeing the growth of the regulatory sector since the economic reforms of 1991 and now i always I almost call the regulatory sector as the fourth arm of the of the governance apart from from the legislative executive and the judicial the regulatory becomes the fourth arm because it can't be slotted in any of these three three uh, heads of govern traditional governance we looked look into and uh, most of the sectors which are which are uh, growing telecom finance sector power sector etc and where the government is leaving this their own traditional monopoly to private now they are getting regulated by various regulatory bodies be tri cci crc ibbi all those uh, so regulatory sector has become very important as a fourth branch of the governance as i call it and uh, it's very essential for people so to get acquainted to this fourth branch as they are acquainted with the three branches uh because of historical reasons and because of the very the way they function so kv kyr series helps in people come to know about the various regulatory bodies their functions and how they help in the smoothing and making their film market efficient uh i and coming to pfrd is one of the leading regulators in the country today especially with this defined pension uh, being no longer in existence i think everyone who is there on a, on salary especially be it public sector or private sector or government sector uh, they, they they trust the, the pfrda to ensure that post working they have a very uh, a very appreciable sum in their hands uh, to to live their balanced life which was not there earlier with the defined pension kind of thing government used to take care so i look forward to listening to mr bandavada the chair person in conversation with dr abha and dr krishna and again thank you all for having me over here thanks a lot thank you thank you dr thank you mr pravin kumar that was lovely uh, now we'll go straight into the conversation and over to you dr kp krishna thank you uh, thanks arkaja let me first uh, begin uh, thanking pravin uh, for his uh, welcome remarks were very thoughtful initial uh, statements uh, when uh, sort of initially i mooted the idea of kyr uh, it was a conversation that i then bounced with uh, the then chairman of foil uh, mr ms sahu uh, who is uh, well known to all of us uh, till recently he was chairperson of the ibbi the insolvency bankruptcy board of india and one reason why i started this conversation uh, with mr sahu is that he's perhaps been in more regulatory agencies than any other uh, senior person that i can recall besides ibbi he was directly uh, associated to the competition commission of india as a member he was secretary of the company secretaries institute of india which is a professional regulator for the 
professional company secretaries. Prior to that, he had been a whole time member of the SEBI. He had spent time in a stock exchange. And at the time that we spoke, he was chairperson of FOIL. And uh, he agreed with me that it was a good idea. And then one thing led to the other. Uh, IICA was uh, very cooperative. We had been associated with IICA and FOIL in all the courses uh, that uh, Praveen, that uh, you are now uh, running. You know, the IICA runs these very popular courses for the middle and senior management of regulators. And being a part of that, it clearly uh, gave us a sense that we need to reach out not only to the hierarchy in the regulatory agencies, but also to the audience outside. And uh, as I said, it was excellent to see such great interest from IICA and ABHA has been a part of this from day one. And uh, CPR uh, was equally enthusiastic. Mekhala and Narkaja from CPR are a part of this. And uh, I have since then left NCAER, but my colleagues from NCAER are part of this. And uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for this excellent cooperation. And uh, to come to today's topic, sir, uh, Mr. Bandupadhyay, it gives mm -hmm. me particular pleasure to have this conversation on the PFRDA, because this is a body that I have been associated with uh, in what we should call my Purvashram. In my previous uh, uh, ashram as a government servant, uh, while I was in the Ministry of Finance, this was at that time a part of the Department of Economic Affairs. The body had just been set up. The executive PFRDA had just been set up and an ordinance had actually been passed in the hope that it would become uh, a parliamentary legislation. Uh, the rest of it is very well known to you. It took another 10 years uh, from the time that this was conceived. The legislation came into being in 2014. Uh, given the long history and the pension related history is even earlier because it's the mid 90s that serious conversations on this topic begin. I thought it would be very useful for us uh, to hear from you, the person who is at the helm of affairs in the regulatory agency and a person who has been dealing with a lot of these subjects in different capacities to tell us what were the problems that PFRDA was set up to address and a little bit of a flavor of have they been, uh, you know, the PFRDA been able to address them. And in the course of this, uh, maybe a little light on what are the functions of PFRDA, what is the interface, so a sort of a general overview. Uh, may I request you, sir, to uh, uh, yeah. respond to this? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. And uh, first of all, my thanks goes to CPR and IICA and yourself, sir, for organizing this kind of uh, sessions. I believe this is the fourth one. And I believe this will go a long way because there are so many regulatory bodies now around. People really do not know who is doing what. And that's why I believe now uh, from KYC moving to KYR, I first heard this term uh, <laughs> just before this session that there is a term called KYR. And then I thought it's very useful in the sense that uh, it will really make people aware that which regulatory body they have to really go to. And as I have been telling, even today also, I, I got uh, uh, this thing from some poor gentleman who is uh, trying to settle uh, his uh, uh, PF claims and he's writing to me that, sir, get my PF claims settled. So, because people do, really do not know who is doing what. So, I believe this kind of sessions will go a long way. And uh, coming to your question, sir, that uh, what are the problems uh, for which uh, PFRDA was set up and which are the problems that we could address? Yes, as you said, sir, the serious conversations around pension system in the country, especially the government pension system, started way back in uh, mid uh, 90s or late uh, 90s, maybe there were reports, one, uh, two authentic reports. One was uh, the OASIS, uh, that was the old age uh, social and income security project. 
and the second was a high level committee which was uh, uh, again headed by a senior uh, civil servant uh, uh, mr bk vatacharya this high level committee report these two reports pointed out basically one thing that the current defined benefit scheme that uh, mr pravin kumar was uh, talking about is uh, becoming unsustainable and uh, that is for certain the way the, the pension bills were growing and uh, it was taking away large part of the total tax revenue for both central and state government and if you take into account the defense pension also that's uh, going to be really unsustainable and it's uh, becoming a very big uh, burden on the exchequer and at the same time old age income security also is to be maintained so what is to be done and i believe uh, that was the, the the political will of the leaders of that point of time that they could uh, really take a strategic strategic reform in the pension sector i believe uh, it, it it was very difficult to come out of the old unfunded defined benefit scheme as as we know it the old pension scheme it was very difficult to come out of it but the political will was such that they really could uh, think that this is high time and uh, and and one more thing happened interestingly because i was working with lic and uh, dr krishnan will remember that was the time in 1998 our retirement ages were increased by 2 years that time we are supposed to retire at 58 and suddenly our uh, then chairman came in one of the meetings and told whether you will like it or not i am going to continue for another 2 years so it happened and we uh, enjoyed the benefit of another extended 2 years so that was the situation that we have gone through and it's a good that uh, this decision was taken at that point of time and that is basically the problems that uh, pfrd was created to address uh, so that's uh, that's what's up so may i um, you know add on to this uh, conversation this thread of the conversation dr krishnan since you were handling this segment with your permission sir uh because here we are talking about the vision and mission of pfrda which you know as is uh, mandated if i would say is regulating nps which is the new pension scheme which is subscribed by employees of government of india state governments and by employees of private institutions and organizations as well as it covers the unorganized sector so this in this entire scheme of things sir the pfrda is ensuring the orderly growth and development of the pension market so since we are talking about the mandate with which pfrda was set up uh, do you think that it has been successful as on date to sort of regulate that market and this i'm also asking in the context of the uh, the rationale for our series the know your regulator series uh, because this is a very important sector so number one you know some in the pre discussions we were having this uh, conversation that um, It, does this sector even need regulation and then the mandate for setting up the pfrda would you like to throw some light upon that sir yes, yes. the moment uh, you go from a unfunded uh, pension system to a funded pension system that is the basic difference between the uh, earlier system and the current system obviously there has to be certain regulations certain rules certain fund management uh, kind of uh, regulations in place so that uh, really the employees for whose benefit it is created those benefits are protected so that was the first uh, this thing mandate that was created yes uh, when we thought about uh, uh, direct benefit to direct trans, uh, direct uh, uh, sorry defined contribution scheme we thought about the the unorganized sector also we thought about retail customers we thought about everything so that time though it started with uh, government it started with central government and then all the states ultimately joined currently also as we see the situation almost all states apart from two state governments and uh, everybody else has joined even all the union territories also have joined that that is the current situation now 
And apart from that, thereafter we opened up to retail segment in 2009 and then to corporates also in a big way. Today, what is happening? The net addition from government sector has come down, obviously, for obvious reasons. But where we are seeing the growth, we are seeing the growth in the retail segment, the corporate segment, and in the unorganized sector. So these, these three, these are actually driving the growth in numbers today, if you look at uh, PFRDA. So I believe uh, the, the purpose for which uh, PFRD was set up, to a great extent, it is fulfilled. And unless we, we have a platform to see that all the subscribers, the fund managers, the data keepers, everything is integrated, then I believe uh, uh, the purpose will not be served and that we have ensured that data security and uh, uh, robust connectivity between all the intermediaries in place. The, this is a uh, unique system that way, the PFRDS system is unique. We work with uh, almost five to six different intermediaries. Normally, if you look at some other regulator, look at the insurance regulator, they will license an insurance company and the insurance company will be doing everything, right from manufacturing a product, selling a product, giving all kinds of servicing, uh, meeting their claims and everything. Everything is done uh, in-house at one place. And it is done by the particular insurance company. But here, each of uh, my intermediaries, they are doing different kind of jobs. Like today, Pension fund managers, they only offer a fund management service and for which they are paid. The fund management charges are paid. But they are not the data keepers. They don't know their customers. So this is the kind of uh, system that we have created. And this system is going on quite well. And it's uh, well connected. And obviously, PFRD has a big role in ensuring that this system remains robust and the system goes on uh, very seamlessly. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, sir. I was reminded when Praveen uh, spoke early on and you spoke about the grievance uh, letters that you keep getting from the EPFO, uh, I wanted to mention one of the columns, I write a column in the business standard, I had entitled one of the columns, who is my regulator, uh, mm -hmm. which is in the context of, there are, uh, you know, since we believe in some activity based regulation, the same entity very often is regulated by multiple regulators. And I guess that is the context in which uh, Praveen was talking about this conflicting jurisdictions. Uh, but in the context of the PFRDA, if I may, uh, in a sense, the original idea was a regulator for the social security, the old age income security of Indians, which means going beyond the, uh, the civil servants, going beyond public sector, in fact, going beyond even the private sector, to a number of people. And, and today, for instance, this talk about the gig economy workers, the Zomato, the Amazon delivery uh, boys and girls, and the nature of work changing the way it is, will it be correct to say that effectively PFRDA has still been pushed into a narrow box of only NPS? and the much larger pension-related issues of India, whether they sit inside the EPFO or specific sectoral pension schemes like BD workers or Seaman Provident Fund, et cetera, et cetera. Many of them continue to exist in a sort of a Trishanku type fashion. So would it not be in uh, sort of talking about the future, an important agenda to sort of bring them all together, to converge them, and to get them into a regulator? I believe uh, uh, you have uh, hit the right spot, uh, Dr. Krishnan. And uh, if I may say so, 
the Bartha PFRDA itself was uh, uh, under some kind of a conflict. Because if you look at the pension sector, already a pension was part of uh, IRDA's domain and insurance companies are selling pension for last uh, maybe more than six decades. I was with LIC and we also have been selling superannuation products. We have been selling annuity products. Uh, but uh, I, I absolutely agree with you uh, pension is too serious a business to be left to different uh, uh, segments and different regulatory bodies. And there has to be a single point focus on pension. If you talk about gig workers, in fact, we had a, uh, some discussion about a universal kind of a pension scheme. Now we find that it has a, a mention in the Social Security Code 2020. I don't know when it is going to be notified. Hopefully it uh, uh, is notified soon. So that that may give some kind of a, a mandatory kind of a pension to gig workers, platform workers, those who really need it today. Yes, we have APY, uh, APY within the age bracket of 18 to 40. And APY is doing quite well. I'm very happy to say that almost uh, this year also 7 million new customers have joined uh, and we are expecting about uh, 10 million. But that is uh, not the number we are looking at because the, 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 if you look at the scope about 40, uh, 460 to 480 million people in the anomaly sector, they, those who are looking for some kind of uh, old age support. So how do we reach out to them? Still, the, 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 there are superannuation products which are self-managed, which does not come under any regulatory body's ambit. They get an income tax approval and they manage on their own. So really we do not know whether the contributions come uh, regularly, whether the employees' uh, benefits are being protected and whether when they retire, they get uh, the right kind of uh, payouts. So all these things are not known. So that's why I believe in the long run, it will be well thought of that if uh, this pension segment is carved out under one particular regulatory body. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, before we move to regulatory method, I thought I'll just ask you a very quick question on uh, what is the organizational structure of the PFRDA? Uh, some of us who deal uh, with you know this, but some of our audience may not know this. So I thought it would be useful to know just in terms of the you know, uh, org structure, physical presence, the sort of different arms of PFRDA to manage the mandate that it is uh, implementing. Yeah, currently actually the authority is headed by a chairperson and followed by three uh, full-time members. Uh, one is a whole time member finance, whole time member economics, and whole time member law. This is the structure today. And apart from that, we are supported by uh, employees. Obviously, all are in the office, uh, officer cadre. And currently, we have a sanctioned strength of about 75, 76 people. Uh, we are recruiting some people now. And in the uh, next two years' time, now we plan to have around 100. 30, 140 people, uh, because there are certain activities. We feel that for that specific kind of activities like research, pension related research, uh, we want to have uh, totally uh, separate uh, inspection teams. We want to have presence uh, not only in Delhi, which is our headquarter, but in other important regional centers to start with maybe Mumbai. So for that, we need uh, more of this thing. And apart from that, uh, of course, uh, we, we are driven by the board. And we have, apart from these four full-time members, including chairperson, we have three uh, part-time members. And uh, these part-time members, normally they are senior government officials who are nominated from the Department of Financial Services, Department of uh, DOPT, DOE, like that. The Department of Expenditure, they come and uh, this is the structure, like basically. So at present, Thank you, sir. PFRDA board does not have 
equivalent of independent members other than the whole time members and other than the uh, sort of institutional representatives who are ex officio mm -hmm. unlike say sebi or unlike the rbi board uh, pfrd does not have independent private persons as members am i right sir yeah yeah but uh, but uh, uh, just to clarify one thing uh, dr krishnan is that the um, act uh, does not stop ah. any private person also to come in these okay. three part time members can be anybody anybody okay so they, they can be uh, experts in their own fields also and that is how the act is also defining it but okay. currently this is the situation okay. Okay. that's what thank you uh, Abha, do you want to move on to the second yes. slide, regulatory yes. methods of PFRD? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, sir, uh, Chairperson, sir, for setting the stage for you know, the fundamentals and the organizational structure of PFRDA. And it's a very, very, I would say, a tricky area to uh, sort of, you know, traverse because uh, like you rightly said that LIC and mutual fund companies um, they are already providing pensionary in instruments and the regulators in those sectors are IDI or SEBI. So PFRDA has a very crucial role and I would say an overarching role. But um, again, you know, I think uh, the focus has been on NPS. So thank you for uh, uh, demystifying, sir. That is a term we like to use often in KYR. And also, sir, now, um, you know, moving to the next uh, bracket of our conversation, which is the regulatory method, where usually we ask a common question to build in a commonality amongst all the regulators. We ask them to um, elaborate on the elements of executive, adjudicatory and legislative functions that they perform. Because we find that all regulators in India are not at par in terms of these three parameters that I just mentioned. Um, like, let's say, FSSAI said that, you know, uh, they do not have the uh, adjudicatory function. CRC has all three. So um, in that context, um, what would you say about, uh, you know, uh, PFRDA, does the government have a policy setting rule? Does a uh, role, does it have uh, power to review and approve decisions taken, taken uh, by PFRDA? Uh, what would be your view, sir, on these three roles as a regulator that PFRDA has to perform? Yeah, and that's, a, that's a great question, I believe. And uh, fortunately, we have all the three functions. Uh, first, coming to the legislative part of it. Yes, uh, um, uh, under Section 52 of the PFRDA Act, uh, we can have our uh, subordinate uh, legislations, which are basically the regulations that we formulate and for and regulations for all the intermediaries that we have. We have, say, regulation for pension fund managers. We have regulation for um, uh, your central record keeping agencies, CRAs, we call them. We have regulations for trusty bank. We have regulations for NPS trust which is a, a trust structure which manages the assets on our behalf. So we have regulations for all the intermediaries. So that is the legislative function. Secondly, so far as the executive part of it is concerned, yes, definitely we have. With this uh, regulations in place, we go for registration of the entities. Uh, we supervise them, monitor their performance, uh, time to time, do their audits, inspections, and we determine their fees and charges, whatever charges they can have. And thirdly, if you come to adjudicatory, adjudicatory functions, yes, definitely we have it. And through those inspections and uh, monitoring systems, if we find there are some breaches in the regulations, obviously, uh, we'll go for the adjudication purpose under Section 30 of the Act. We have given all the right to call for uh, the, all the records, go through it, and find out if there are serious breaches. We can uh, impose penalties on them also. So all these uh, functions are there with us, and uh, we enjoy a lot of uh, uh, independence also, for that matter, because you, you had a question that who approves the decisions and all that. Mostly all these decisions are there with the board, like the regulation part of it. 
So regulations, uh, whenever amendments or certain changes are brought in, uh, it goes to the board and board is the final authority and their the central government will have very little this thing to say, but only so far as it uh, entails the, the benefit of the central government employees or the government employees, they are only obviously the government's role will come into play. Like today also you have seen uh, almost three years back, central government decided on the recommendation of the seventh pay commission to increase their contribution from 10% to 14%. So obviously that is a basically a central government role. There PFRDA has nothing to say. All the CCS NPS rules that comes are out from Department of Pension and Pension as Welfare. So there they have a role. But apart from that, apart from the government sector, on the regulation part of it, or the adjudication functions, or the executive functions, we are free to carry out all those things. Wonderful, sir. Thank you, sir. Because then, you know, that sort of satisfies us as researchers in the regulatory space, because the whole idea of being a regulator, of establishing a regulator, is to have autonomy. And um, uh, corroding of that autonomy is something that you know, we all have to be guarded against. And of course, the regulator also has a very unique role to play in today's times where uh, you sort of have to watch from a distance and let the market uh, uh, function as freely and as uh, um, flexibly as possible. Uh, so that would bring us to uh, you know, a follow-up question because you see, to avoid old age poverty, um, pensions must be designed to meet the basic needs of especially the vulnerable groups. So uh, in that context, would it be correct to say that PFRDA has established fair terms of engagement between the savers, uh, people who are saving for pensions of any category, and the sellers of pension products, that is the pension funds? And um, what, what, what are the main features sir, of these terms of engagement and how does PFRDA get into the regulation part of this, uh, uh, this whole process? Okay, so just a small correction here. The pension fund managers here are not the uh, sellers of the product. Actually, if you look at it, it's a very unique structure. NPS is a given product. Only is that uh, they are managing the funds on our behalf. Even POPs are also, also not sellers. The points of presence, they are the only the distribution channel. This is the product, a given product that they are distributing. So what we are trying to do is to ensure that uh, there is a lot of transparency in the system to ensure that whoever comes into the system, they will know exactly what are the costs like. And as you have seen, and people also say that possibly this is the lowest cost financial product available, not only in the country, but uh, in the world also. How we can say with a little bit of confidence is that uh, we, we engage a, a lot with uh, Indian, uh, sorry, international uh, organizers of uh, pension supervisors, IOPS, uh, we shared our data with them and IOPS said, looking at our cost structure, overall cost structure and this thing, is that you are an outlier because we don't take your cost structure into our calculation because otherwise everything will go for a loss. And uh, we have seen the lowest cost uh, jurisdictions also across the world. Uh, we are far, far below. So one is that uh, we give that uh, cost benefit uh, to the, the, this thing. We give a lot of data, a lot of information to the customer who comes in. And at the same time, we give them a lot of flexibility. If I go back to the high level expert uh, committee report, there one important thing came out, out uh, apart from the fact that the pension, uh, the DB pension is becoming unsustainable. They talked about government employees who have not rendered a certain number of years of service, they will not get this pension. And you cannot uh, transfer this pension account anywhere else. So they talked about portability. So the biggest advantage which is brought into this system is portability. Today you are in government sector, tomorrow you can be in private sector, thereafter you can be on your own. You can have your own uh, sort of um, this thing, 
business. But there also you can continue with the same unique account wherever you go. Absolutely, there will be no change. And just to keep the account alive, you pay 1000 rupees a year. And that's all that we are asking for. Secondly, is that what about the intermediaries? Not only we are thinking about the subscribers, we are thinking about the intermediaries who are giving me all these services, that their operation also has to be sustainable at some point of time. It's not that I'll only talk about cost, low cost, lowest cost and all that. And at the same time, the intermediaries do not get their dues. At regular intervals, we are looking into their cost structure, like the central record keeping agencies. We have rationalized it. Now we are looking into the point of presence uh, cost structure. So next few days, it will be out because we also felt that it is too low. And, and to take NPS and APY out to, to the masses, what we have done, now we are telling the POPs that you can uh, induct individuals also in the system. The feeds on street at the, as they call it. And in insurance, we used it uh, quite effectively to reach out to the individuals who really need and the, the segment that we are talking about. Their individuals need to go to them and explain to them. So POP, this thing is being uh, rationalized. Uh, last year, April, we have rationalized the fund management charges of the pension fund managers because they are also not making money. They are running into losses. So we thought that unless their business is sustainable, uh, they will not uh, find it uh, motivating to continue like this. And I'm very happy we had seven pension fund managers in last one year after the cost is rationalized. We have seen three new uh, this thing licenses being granted and hope in another three, four months time, these other three pension fund managers also will start working. So it's a fair play between, between the service providers, between the, uh, the, the actual subscribers. And we want to see that this kind of fair play remains. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So I think uh, this is very, very important. Uh, the one point of portability, market portability that you mentioned, and also the fact that individuals can take up uh, these schemes and especially the NPS. So I think, uh, and also the final point of, uh, of a regulator, you know, that of market correction, that, uh, you know, the, these kind of interventions that PFRD is doing, I think that is the main role of a regulator to make sure that a free and fair market, and along with that market correction, in right dosages where and when required. Um, so could you throw some light on who are the key players in this entire scheme of things besides the employer, the employee, and the pension fund? And what is the role of the state government uh, uh, with regard to the pension of their employees and that of the center? I mean, in terms of proportion or in terms of the role, the quantum of role of the state government vis-a-vis -vis the central government? Okay. So if you look at the, uh, the infrastructure, the intermediaries who are working with us, as I said, it's a very, very unique unbundled structure that we are following. I believe no regulatory body is following this kind of a structure. Like each year job is performed by uh, a particular uh, expert kind of a group of people. Like uh, we have uh, points of presence. Currently we have about 93 points of presence. These are the distribution channels. Basically, these are banks, uh, NBFCs, and all these kind of uh, people, those who are having. Uh, we have retirement advisors also. Of course, that scheme has not come off quite well. Now we are going, as I said, we are going into individual uh, players also in the uh, distribution market. Third, secondly, we have the central record keeping agencies. These uh, are very important agencies who actually keep the data of the customers and not only keep the data, uh, they, they instruct the banks through which the money flows in that where to which pension fund managers the, the money should go for investment. And uh, they 
And they, they are may, maybe the, the central piece of the entire system. We have currently three. We started with NSDL, and of course, the name is now changed. They call them protein, protein e-governance. Uh, secondly is uh, K-Fintech. And thirdly, we have given a license to another uh, uh, record keeping agency that is CAMS. So they are going to start operation from next month. Uh, secondly is the trusty bank. When the money comes in, it has to flow through some banking channels. So we have a single trusty bank as of today, that is Axis Bank. They are managing the entire fund flow right from the uh, POPs of the customers uh, into that bank account. And then at the instruction of the central record keeping agencies, it goes to the uh, particular pension fund managers. Then we have pension fund managers. As I said, now we have seven active pension fund managers and three licenses have already been issued. So in next three, four months time, we'll see them up and running. Uh, these are basically the other things. And then we have the annuity service providers because today also in our act, the only way of exit, and that is again, a little point of irritation is through annuity. 60% of your purpose you can take back tax-free and 40% has to be converted into annuity. Of course, that conversion process also is tax-free, but obviously when the annuity comes back, like anything that comes back out of your investment is taxable, annuity also is taxable. So we have about 14 uh, annuity service providers. These are IRDI controlled entities and they, they provide a different kind of annuities. So actually we have been looking at uh, other payout products also, and that is uh, in our wish list in our proposed uh, PFRD amendment bill. If it comes through, I believe it will give a lot of options to the retiring public from NPS that not only they have to think about annuity, but they can think about other payout um, options also. So these are basically the, the intermediaries uh, with which uh, we are working. So far as the state and central government is concerned, uh, we have intermediaries in the sense that their nodal officers are our intermediaries. And uh, huge number of nodal officers are there because these nodal officers ensure that uh, when the monthly salary is paid, the exact amount is deducted from their salary and the contribution of the state or the central government is also added together and the money is sent to the system. But here the biggest challenge that we face today is the delay. One is that maybe uh, not deducting in time or even if it's a deduction is happening in time, the money is not coming to the system in time. And our system is very, very dynamic today. You, give the money today, it will be invested today itself. So if there is a delay of say 15, 20, 30 days, you don't know what kind of opportunities you have missed. So this is the challenge that we face with the state and uh, uh, central government. Obviously, we are talking to the nodal officers, we try to educate them, but uh, 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 we are working through the CCS NPS rules also. For the first time in CCS NPS rules, uh, provision is brought in and very, very welcome change also that if there is a delay, uh, there'll be a penalty clause and, and maybe individual penalty also will be posed. And in fact, in the proposed amendment bill also, we have uh, uh, proposed that uh, it will be treated, this uh, dues will be treated like any other statutory dues, like income tax after deduction. If you don't remit it within a certain period of time, uh, one is uh, open to all kinds of uh, actions. So similarly, that also, if the same kind of importance is given to uh, this thing, uh, NPS contribution, I believe things will really fall in place. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So, um, so that brings to mind a very 
um, you know, a cause of concern that one keeps hearing, especially from the new recruitees in the government sector, you know, because they're always comparing the previous uh, traditional pension scheme to the new pension scheme. And the fact that, you know, uh, the new pension scheme is market linked. So uh, someone even, I, I heard someone saying that, you know, supposing you, you retire in a pandemic, you retire poor. And if you retire in a good time when the economy is booming, um, so you're a rich person at retirement. So those kind of concerns are there in the general public. Uh, are they valid, number one? And um, that leads me also to, you know, to sort of the, the last question of this particular segment, which is that there are different kinds of complaints, I'm sure, that come up before the PFRDA. And uh, what would be the mechanisms for such grievance redressal? And do the beneficiaries have an active role in such kind of a redressal? But especially that market-linked feature that is new to you know, the, the whole concept of pension funds in India, it still hasn't sunk in into the general public psyche. Uh, as the chairperson, you know, as, at the hem of affairs, how would you sort of justify or, you know, placate a person who's very, very worried about pension, uh, you know, at the time of retirement, and especially in a, in a difficult time such as the pandemic, when the pensionary benefits are market linked, sir? So uh, if you if you compare between the old pension scheme and obviously these market link pension schemes, obviously these two things are not comparable at all. And if I still try to say that the DC pension scheme is the best in the world, no, obviously, if you start comparing with that. Because uh, there are two, three things. Uh, uh, of course, Dr. Krishnan is there. One was that uh, it was uh, no amount of contribution was required in the old pension scheme absolutely no amount of contribution. Secondly, on retirement, not only it ensures a 50% uh, uh, replacement rate, but at the same time, it is adjusted to inflation every six months. And not only that, with every wage rise, with every pay commission coming in, the old pension also gets uh, adjusted uh, to, to that increased accordingly. So obviously, there is no comparison between the two. But uh, in a market-linked scheme also, we, we have created a uh, situation under which I can tell you that we, we uh, monitor the performance of the pension fund managers. We have very strict investment guidelines. Of course, we have given them some scope also for the growth. But at the same time, we ensure that they don't become too much adventurous because basically these are retirement monies. And I can tell you that uh, since 2009, we are managing uh, private sector funds also over a period of almost 13 years now, the CAGR under our equity uh, scheme is about 13 and half percent. Obviously last uh, uh, year or so, we have seen a lot of uh, growth in the equity market. So I do not talk about a one-year performance because sometimes one-year performance, uh, maybe um, um, it, it is not giving the entire picture. So a 13-year performance is like that. Even a corporate bond uh, kind of uh, uh, funds, corporate bond funds of ours, over 13 years, it has given a CAGR of 9.72. We have seen so many corporate credit events in the market. Despite that, we could wither those things and see that uh, it is giving these kind of returns. Yes, government uh, bond uh, performance is little lesser, but still it is around 9.3 to 9.4 percent because the interest rates are hardening today. But uh, if we uh, look over a period of time and if you take a blended return of say, equivalent amount in equity, corporate bond, and uh, government securities, I believe still it will be uh, over 10%. So that's not, a, I believe, a bad return. And it's very, very uh, competitive kind of a return that uh, we are trying to give. We have benchmarks in place, and we ensure that the uh, pension fund managers are also working close to the benchmarks. And if there are huge deviations, we definitely ask them questions and try to find out what is going wrong. So that way I can assure the subscribers 
that will ensure that they get a good return uh, when, <clears throat> when they retire. And don't be too much uh, concerned about these short-term volatilities. Financial markets will have volatilities, uh, but uh, will ensure that over a period of time, we'll choose the right kind of securities for you to ensure that uh, you get a, a sizable corpus. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Actually, that uh, you know, the last five minutes uh, discussion on the NPS and on the corpus actually takes us to the heart and, and at, in a sense, the difficult knife edge walk of the regulator. Namely, it is not the regulator's job to ensure good return. It is the regulator's job to ensure that no malpractices, the, uh, the relevant regulated entities are behaving in the manner prescribed. And essentially, a lot of the risks are to be taken by the informed investor. But I think you've brought out very nicely the difficulty in a pension situation where a lot of the choice is not necessarily exercised by the investor. So there is a, a sort of a dilution of the role of the investor and, and that role is performed by more than one person. And I think you brought out the difficulties and this knife edge walk very well. Uh, thank you for that. If I may, can I take you back to one important point uh, that you made uh, in the answer to about three or four questions before, namely the, uh, the annuitization part, the fact that a large corpus once accumulated necessarily needs to be annuitized. And I recall from 2004, this used to be one of the most sort of agonizing uh, questions, namely, the PFRDA is there to ensure old age income security, but individuals and economics tells us that individuals will have myopia and will want to cash out. Individuals will not be necessarily as interested in accumulating a large corpus as, quote unquote, the society would. So this constant struggle of allowing withdrawals for X, Y, Z reasons uh, is, is a struggle that I see PFRDA constantly struggles with. Uh, any quick thoughts on that, sir? How much should this be done by regulator? And how much of this should be done by educating the public and letting the individual take this difficult call? Yeah, uh, so first to talk about the annuity part of it, uh, the, the biggest challenge uh, in an annuity situation is that once you get into an annuity, you are stuck for the lifetime, whatever may be the rates like. And these are all currently, as we see today, are fixed rate annuities, that uh, there is no variable annuities available in the market, and it does not move along the interest rate scenario and currently as we have seen uh, the annuity rates are varying between anything between five to six percent five percent to six percent and these are the annuity rates for a person normally who is asking for an annuity and thereafter on death asking for the corpus to be uh, refunded uh, to the nominees and in uh, Indian human psyche, normally we see 90% people go for this. They feel that uh, after I'm not there anymore, it is my duty to give away that corpus uh, to my near and dear ones. Whether they really need that money or not, that is another question altogether. And uh, we see that in many cases, maybe they will not be requiring that. But despite that, they give away a proposition of getting a higher annuity by choosing this particular kind of things. Yes, so th that, is, that is a big challenge uh, in the uh, system as it is uh, 
they are today. So far as the uh, exits are concerned, yes, uh, that is uh, one of the biggest complaints against the NPS system is that NPS system actively discourages early access to the funds. Uh, but uh, after considerable deliberation also, we felt that yes, we can give some early uh, this thing withdrawals also. Like today we allow uh, three times uh, partial withdrawal during the entire system. And these are also for the same reasons that EPFO gives like uh, for construction of a house, for marriage of children, for meeting certain medical conditions and all that. So six, seven different reasons are there for which we give 20%, 25% of the contribution of the subscriber as withdrawal that we give. But beyond that, we do not really allow because otherwise what happens in EPFO situation, we have seen that since early accesses are uh, freely available, so many times when people really retire, they are left with almost no corpus at all. So that is again, the other side of the story. So we thought that since it is basically a system to give old age uh, security, at least let there be a substantial part left till the last day when they will really require that in a big way. Thank you, sir. That is helpful, uh, which in a sense uh, uh, sort of takes me to the sue, which I'm sure you, uh, while for instance in LIC would have handled. The ideal view that experts talk about is that individuals should ideally have different instruments for different financial goals. NPS or the pension product is not exactly the ideal uh, instrument for say medical contingency or for housing. But I guess in a developing country, a not so rich country where a bulk of our subscribers are not likely to be high income people, this kind of uh, competing claims on a limited amount of savings will I think constantly be uh, facing you and striking that balance is important. In this context, Though we are not yet in question answer session, I thought it will be useful to get your attention to a question that Manohar Puranik has posed, namely, what is it that PFRDA is doing for greater education of its investors and customers? Because critically, that is going to be an important factor going forward. PFRDA can only do so much because you need enlightened, reasonably well-informed investors and customers. And I'm sure that's one of your high priorities. Would you like to throw some, um, throw some light on the educational activities of PFRDA? Okay. So um, uh, I, I believe uh, that that's uh, one of the most important aspects uh, and for any financial product having uh, this kind of uh, awareness about pension uh, is uh, very, very important. And for that, we already have uh, training agencies in place. We are doing some uh, online trainings. On annuity and related matters, retirement related matters, we have annuity literacy programs. And for last uh, almost two, two and a half years, we have 30 sessions. Uh, some initially we started before the pandemic, obviously, uh, these were physical sessions and some of the places like uh, Patna, when we had gone, about 300 people were there in the auditorium and about 500 people were waiting outside the auditorium. And we have seen a lot of, lot of interest and people are telling that, uh, suppose at 60, I want to con uh, still contribute, whether I'll be able to contribute. So all these kind of questions are coming. They are not really looking at retirement at the age of 60. Maybe they are thinking of going beyond that. So these kind of things also we are doing. Obviously now these are all EALPs and there also we see lot of interest people from different corners of the country. They join and they participate. They ask their questions and almost 75% uh, of the time in those ELPs are kept only for question answers 
we bring in annuity service providers also that uh, how to choose the annuity. Uh, we bring in our central record keeping agency also. We bring in our fund managers also to tell them about all those things. Apart from that, what, uh, what was uh, really missing and what we are trying to do is to create an industry body. Like uh, what uh, say maybe AMFI or uh, insurance councils have done in their respective set, uh, sectors. I believe we also need and uh, urgently need our industry body. Already our NPS trust is working on that. They are bringing together the fund managers, the record keeping agencies, the points of presence and all together to create kind of awareness. So all these things are going together and latest, uh, what we are trying to do is to have a resource person like concept that SEVI also had. And we are bringing those kind of uh, resource persons will be going around and talking about pension in general and uh, telling them as to how and why they should have pension. And one very interesting thing, uh, Dr. Krishnan, that you mentioned, and I also agree to it, uh, though, though I represent uh, PFRD and the pension sector, uh, on different forums, I talk about uh, not only pension, I talk about health insurance, I talk about life insurance. These, all these things should be taken together because by uh, contributing into NPS, all, of course, my corpus will go up, and um, it will look nice, but the person is not protected. The family is not protected. So that's why it has to be a combination of all these things ultimately. And I believe there, and I strongly believe that different regulatory bodies like uh, we, IRDA, we can work together to find out, find out a common forum through which we can educate people more about all these things. Working in insurance industry, I have seen for 35 years, pension was uh, also ran kind of a product. It, it never, never was uh, the top seller. And uh, ultimately, if somebody is really insisting on a pension, we'll be selling a pension. Otherwise, nobody, no uh, insurance uh, agent uh, or advisor will go out and actively talk about pension. But a time has come with the kind of longevity that we are seeing today. I believe uh, pension is also one of the very important segments that everybody should be talking about. So that's my feeling. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, so if I may, since sir talked about uh, longevity, sir, and I think you really you know touched upon a very important topic, sir, because there have been quite a few researches, some very pension specific uh, by the OECD and by so many other agencies, but mainly stressing upon the fact, uh, especially in the Asian context, that the demographic transition to fewer babies and longer lives that took about a century in Europe and North America. In Asia, this transition will often occur in a single generation. Mm -hmm. And you're very well, all of us, I think, are very well aware of this. So it is said that Asia's pension system needs modernizing very urgently uh, to ensure that you know, we are financially sustainable and provide adequate retirement incomes. And I think in one of the three meetings, sir, something that you said struck a chord uh, with me, which, where you said that you know, retiring at 60 is one thing, but with the longevity, the sustenance of a person along with a spouse or dependents, till the age of, let's say, 80, 75, 80, that becomes a huge question mark. So do you think the transition uh, in the pension scheme, all these instruments that you have laid out and uh, the NPS, uh, which is now open to individuals, the PF, of course, you know, was, was, was more concentrated to an organization which would have a minimum of 20 employees. Uh, so an individual who wants to opt for NPS can also do that. So do you think this transition in the pensionary framework of the country is a response to the larger demographic issue and the longevity issue? And do you think it is enough? Yeah, longevity, as, as you rightly pointed out, is a, is a 
very big issue today very big issue today and uh, uh, as we are seeing the 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 life expectancy at bath is uh, close to 69 years in india and life expectancy at the age of 60 is another 18 to 20 years and uh, female longevity again is uh, two years more than the male uh, longevity so uh, these are things which is happening in india today so that's why thinking about the longevity uh, i believe we have to start quite early very early to ensure that we reach uh, those kind of situations in uh, we do a lot of uh, industry sessions with uh, cii fiki indian chamber of commerce phd chamber of commerce and all that we get questions and uh, mostly the questions are coming from people who are in the late 40s or early 50s that I have accumulated so much of some and I need this kind of a pension at the end of the day. So how much do you think you uh, need to accumulate in next 10 years time? But in most of the uh, situations, we, we see that it's uh, too late by the time um, they, they are starting. Uh, but it's uh, very difficult to tell them on their face that it's a uh, so the next best thing we tell them that it is better late than never. So, and tell them that, uh, yes, you can still start and accumulate like this. So that way NPS is a very, very flexible system at a young age when a per person starts. And uh, uh, if they, they don't have too much of cash flow, they can contribute, as I said, even a thousand rupees a year to uh, keep that account alive. And whenever they have had cash flows, uh, you contribute more and ensure that whatever you require at the end of the life that is there. And again, if you look at the replacement rate, uh, we have calculated a replacement rate of, uh, say, young IT graduate joining at the age of 25 years, having a salary of 30,000 rupees a month, and maybe a yearly uh, increment of say 8% per annum. And if the inflation plays out to be around 5% per annum. And they depend only on the mandatory benefits of provident fund and gratuity. What replacement rate they are going to get? Around 25%. That is, a, they are going to get only 25% of their last one salary. Whether that will be enough. People feel, yes, it will be. But um, I don't think so, because uh, the biggest cost today, post uh, 60 or 65, is the medical cost. Mm -hmm. We talk about life expectancy. We talk about the mortality experience. Everything is going great. But we don't talk about the morbidity experience. Morbidity is the quality of life that we lead beyond, say, 60, 65, mm -hmm. and all that. And and uh, pandemic has uh, shown us the kind of costs it may entail. So that's why it's uh, um, very good to be prepared and well in advance, I believe, to ensure that because these longevity issues are going to really catch up with us in a big way. And then just to just to tell you uh, to look into that issue. Uh, now we have opened up both the uh, retail customers and the corporate customers also that they can continue after 60 years. So if uh, they don't give a choice of closing down at the age of 60, it will be automatically taken that they wish to continue. And uh, after even one year or two years also, after 60, if they wish to close their account at any point of time, they can close it we allow them to continue up to the age of 75. Till the other day it was 70, we increased it to 75. In between any time they can close it and they can take their 60% money and go for annuitization of 40% and they can enjoy the pension. Thank you. Uh, as we come closer to the end, uh, while we have another uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, can I ask you, sir, to spend a few minutes talking about 
uh, the capacity that is required in a regulator like uh, the PFRDA in terms of staffing, technical expertise. For instance, you alluded to the design of this default option. This is something on which economists and behavioral experts have spent enormous amount of time. How does one design the default option and, and fairly technical matters? So does the PFRDA have the flexibility uh, to hire the kind of talent it needs? Does it have the flexibility to offer scales that the markets uh, on some of these talent require? Does it have the funds? I'm packing in a lot of questions. The idea is, does it have, given that you don't have too much fee income and you are uh, promoting a low cost pension system, and you would, I guess, be dependent, therefore, on budgetary grants. So given all of that, how does PFRDA handle the question of regulatory capacity and regulatory independence? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's a very, very important question for us. Uh, and I am very happy, Dr. Krishnan, uh, to tell you uh, the year of pandemic, uh, this 2021, was in fact a turnaround year for us. So we are celebrating Azadi Ka Amrit Mahatsav. We have also become financially independent in the year oh. 2021. I see. I see. From 2021, and this is, we are ending almost 21, 22. We have not taken a single budgetary grant for running our operations. So to a great extent, uh, again, our autonomy and independence is uh, maintained. And thanks to the board and thanks to the support of the government of India also, uh, we have been able to manage our uh, things uh, quite nicely within ourselves. And not only that, uh, we, we have been able to set up a small fund to the extent that we are going to have our own office building in maybe next uh, one year's time. So that is one. Uh, so, so far as the recruitment of uh, capacity building and recruitment of uh, experts uh, in different fields are uh, concerned, we don't have any monetary constraint at least. In our latest uh, recruitment, which is going on now, and I believe by uh, end of February, these people will be on board. For the first time, we are recruiting actuaries. Nobody okay. told us, but we thought that ultimately NPS is not going to be the only product with which PFRD will be working. Yes, that is going to be the mainstay because the product is very, very flexible. When we started in 2004 and today, after 17, 18 years, uh, the product has changed its structure and shape quite a bit. We have given a lot of, lot of flexibilities today. But that being the mainstay, there has to be other kind of products also, pension products that we are looking forward to. The first thing that we, we have started with uh, and which was a mandate under the act and we could not do earlier is a minimum assured return scheme, MARS, as we call it. And already the uh, consultant is being engaged and I believe in next seven, 10 days time, we'll be engaging the consultant, we'll be working with them. And this is the accumulation phase during which we'll be giving a minimum uh, assured return, which again, under the market link scheme is very difficult to give. And almost uh, nowhere in the country, we have this kind of a scheme working. But uh, we hope in the next six to eight months time, uh, we'll have at least the first basic product available there. It will look into many, many aspects because Mars is not a simple, simple scheme because the moment you bring in the concept of uh, assured return under the market link scheme, obviously we are looking into the solvency aspect of the fund managers. Currently they are passed through entities. I give them a fund, they give certain kind of return, net of their expenses, and that is the end of the story. But the moment I tell him that no, 
whatever may be the market conditions even under the toughest of market conditions you have to give a certain kind of finite return the concept of solvency comes in so obviously they have to be adequately capitalized also so this is one area we are looking into and once the mars is uh, successfully implemented thereafter we will be looking to other kinds of uh, products if the pfrd okay. amendment bill allows us to go into the exit related products we'll be looking into that uh, the thing that is in our mind is some kind of a systematic wage well plan as an alternative to uh, annuity that also we'll be looking into and apart from actuaries uh, we are looking into uh, finance uh, uh, people we are uh, recruiting chartered accountants uh, cost accountants company secretaries we are recruiting uh, uh, economist we are re recruiting statistician mm -hmm. to go into the research aspects and all that and i believe as we go along and recruit more people a large number of people will be from these different expert groups already we engaged and we got the report from bcg our consultant Uh, which is looking into two three aspects one is obviously the separation of the nps trust that was one part secondly the entire hr aspect of uh, pfrda and the areas where pfrda should be looking into where we are currently not doing much of work kind of uh, personnel that we need and thirdly the entire revamping of the entire it infrastructure of uh, uh, pfrda so that is uh, almost a one year kind of a project that we'll be looking into and all these things are in the offing and we are working on that okay okay thank you thank you so much sir uh, arkaja had a question and before i hand over to her ava do you have any quick question otherwise we are close to the end uh, i'll hand over first to ava in case you have any questions and thereafter to arkaja i just had uh, you know a few summary points because from uh, thank you so much uh, mr bandubadhyay chairperson sir i think you've been extremely lucid about a very very complex um, uh, state of things i may say so you know as researchers in the field uh, when we talk about the theory of pension systems uh, we have sort of in our conversation in the past 90 minutes or so uh, actually laid out the same uh you know theoretical part that is given in every theory of pension studies which is that there are four major types of risks that are identified you know uh which i think through your conversation you have elucidated upon the financial risk the longevity risk the behavioral and the regulatory risk now we of course wanted to focus and we have on the regulatory risks but just for the benefit of the audience and there are a lot of students who are usually interested in our kyr series uh the financial risk that we have referred to time and again is that uh, you know the fact that for pension funds the returns to the underlying financial assets are uncertain and variable so thus one may what happens is that one may end up with the lower pension than anticipated given how much was saved and then the longevity risk is something that you have thrown light upon sir which was that the individual life span is uncertain and unless provisions are taken to avoid this there is a risk that one may outlive the pension needs then of course there are behavioral risks which is the third category of risk that denotes the risk associated with individual non professional portfolio management which you said you know where your in uh, your uh, education that uh, you know the advocacy by pfrda uh, plays a huge role uh, because this is largely demonstrated in the behavioral economics literature and this includes a tendency to trade too often uh, and thereby you incur excessive trading costs to under diversify portfolios portfolios and to fail to regularly balance the risk profile as the retirement gets closer so somewhere in your conversation you mentioned that you know some people start off too late so there's no point then of saving and to think about a pension fund so that is where the financial literacy for individually managed pension savings uh, comes into play and finally what we've been talking talking about the regulatory risks that are present with respect to the governance of pension funds and the key issues here would be the transparency of management fees and the ability to charge pension providers or uh, to change sorry pension providers or fund managers 
So um, there, I think you elaborated on the large differences that exist in the management fees for you know, funding of various kinds of pension products, not necessarily related to performance. So I think this is uh, this would be my take on the entire conversation and sort of to summarize. And thank you so much, sir, for your time. That is my last um, uh, comment. Thank you so much, sir. Over to you, Alkaja. Thank you, Abha. And thank you, Mr. Bandopadhyay, for this absolutely fascinating talk and you know how you've laid it all out so clearly. Um, so uh, I have a question of my own, but I'll also quickly go through. We have a couple of questions from audience members. Uh, so I'll just quickly read them out and then maybe I'll put my question also uh, you know, along with that. And you know, we could just quickly look to answer all those three. So Rishika from the National Law School Program on Regulatory Governance, she wants to, she, her question is, PFRDA currently raises some funds through fees, but otherwise through grants. Do they face any budgetary constraints to implement some of their mandates or goals? Any future plans to increase their funds? This is Rishika's question. And uh, Atul Kumar Singh who wants to know, he says, hello, sir, I'm a central government employee. My question is, why can't I invest 75% of my 75% uh, uh, of my corpus in equity? So it's a very specific question, but I think it's the sort of question you get a lot, you know, this is, you know, at the heart of what PFRDA does. And so I think this, this is a, you know, it's an excellent question to ask here. And uh, yeah, so maybe you could answer these two questions and then I'll get yeah, to mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the answer to the first question, I believe I touched upon uh, when Dr. Krishnan was asking me. Yes, we depend on uh, only the regulatory fees. And as I said, uh, since last two years, we have become totally financially independent. We don't uh, depend on budgetary grants anymore. And uh, that way, uh, I, I believe that... Uh, uh, that's very good for PFRDA itself. So that uh, independently, we can do a lot many things like recruiting people, recruiting professionals of our choice, and uh, investing in IT systems in a big way, and all those things. So uh, for that, we do not uh, need to look forward to government support anymore. So that is the first question, I believe. And second question is very specific, is that 75% uh, for government employees. Actually, unfortunately, the government options, these were opened up after a lot of discussions in 2019, with a effect from April 2019, it was opened up. And currently, they have allowed maximum uh, equity exposure of uh, 50%. But uh, that too, 50%, uh, that we call it uh, uh, auto kind of uh, uh, investment. So this auto choice is nothing but uh, it uh, follows a life cycle fund pattern where up to the age of 35, it will be 50% in equity and balance 50% will be uh, going into bonds and government securities. And it uh, follows uh, the same dictum that as the age goes up, your ability to take risk goes down. So from 36 onwards, uh, with uh, every passing year, your equity component will come down. So that is the uh, downside of it. Yes, definitely we'll be in touch with the uh, government of India also. And to uh, tell them to slowly allow other things like we have allowed 75% in equity in uh, private sector. So if somebody is ready to take that kind of a risk, and come and invest up to 75% in equity. It's uh, welcome, whether it is government sector or private sector. So from PFRDA side, absolutely there is no bar, but since uh, the government investment pattern basically comes from government of India only, we'll be in touch with them. Thank you, Mr. Bandapadhyay for that. And, you know, I think this nicely kind of, you know, it really, uh, you know, the, the ongoing, there's something unique about the position and the design of PFRDA. You know, I believe there is global practice in pension regulation, but PFRDA has, even in that global practice, quite a specific kind of mand a mandate in the sort of ongoing privatization or the transition, actually the transformation in the management of public sector pensions. And therefore in really the, there's a developmental aspect, you know, that's quite important, the Pension Fund Regulatory and Development Authority, because there's a developmental and an ongoing aspect in, you know, it's a, it's a, 
kind of slow burn. Uh, it's a slow burn, long term type of reform, if you would call it that, of the government systems, in which uh, you know PFRD has this job of establishing a system and establishing the structures and the principles for the NPS. Now, you know, I have a question relating to that, which is the sources for your principles and the sources for, you know, the technical expertise and the, the establishment of norms. So where, where does this come from? You know, is a lot of it derived from financial industry practice? Uh, is global practice a big part of the, is of the, you know, of the sources of your regulatory, sort of the regulatory content? And, uh, you know, even in terms of you've, you've talked, you talked quite a lot about the types of technical expertise and the types of recruitment. So I think these sources also get determined a little bit by discipline and determined a little bit by subject. So, I, you know, if you could, you know, as we close, I think, you know, throw light a bit, a little bit of light on this, it would be great. So basically, two sources that uh, we depend on, and uh, we look at the other financial sector regulators and their best practices also. And quite often I say that it's uh, always better to be the last financial regulator of the block because we know what people tried, where people failed and where people succeeded and what uh, other things that are going well. So we are trying to learn from them. And secondly, uh, yes, international practices also. We are keeping abreast of the international practices. Obviously all those things cannot be imported and immediately applied in Indian context, but we are trying to uh, work on that. Like uh, this uh, uh, systematic withdrawal plan in some of the countries abroad, and we are talking to them, uh, trying to find out how, how they are managing it uh, uh, very seamlessly and smoothly. So we are also learning from Back, back, back from customers, back from people in general, in general. So, and even our intermediaries also, that if you do this way, maybe it will be better. We work with a lot of CPSCs, Central Public Sector Enterprises. Uh, their superannuation funds, they are shifting to us. And uh, almost 58, 60, some large Central Public Sector Enterprises, they felt it is better managed by uh, PFRDA under the NPS regime than they themselves managing it. So there also we get a lot of feedbacks from them, uh, what, what their employees want and all that. And we try to work on that. So thank you with this weekend close. I think we had just, just run over time. And thank you so much, Mr. Bandipadia, for this you know, rich and detailed and frank conversation. And to uh, Mr. Praveen Kumar, I, Director General of IICA, who's been with us throughout. Uh, to Dr. KP Krishnan and Abha, Dr. Abha Yadav, who've been such you know, wonderful interlocutors, you know, so knowledgeable. And you know, it's been such an interesting conversation also because of you know, what they brought to it. So thank you all. And we will be back next month with another KYR where we will look forward to seeing you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, you CPA. Thank you, IICA. And thank you, above all, Dr. Krishnan. Good thank you. Thank you. Very kind of you. Thanks, thank you. Praveen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vandapan. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Praveen. Thank you.